First of all, allow me to welcome you all, our colleagues in Asia Pacific, good afternoon, uh, our colleagues in Europe, uh, good morning, and uh, for the rest of you, good day, uh, the rest of the world. I'm very happy to be uh, hosting together with my two colleagues our first live webinar under the Coach and Innovation Hub uh, project uh, in uh, Philippines. Evaluating of the food culture in the Philippines is the topic of the day. We welcome all of your questions for the last uh, Q&A session as well, and we hope there will be a lot of useful information for our uh, experts uh, that are joining from uh, Philippines as well as uh, international uh, audience. First of all, uh, there will be brief uh, agenda. I want me to introduce the uh, first event and our upcoming planned events uh, in, in short in a short overview. Uh, then my colleague, uh, Gilda Garibay, the project leader, will be giving you a background of the Philippine Food Cold Chain Project. And finally, my colleague, Devin Yoshimoto, will be uh, will be giving you the market research uh, overview, of course, with the uh, also with the aspect of the alternative technology. First of all, uh, we would like to uh, share our, uh, our, our excitement about the audience that joined uh, today's live webinar. Actually, the last count uh, that we checked was over 190 uh, delegates uh, from uh, more than 90 organizations uh, worldwide. We have listed some of the countries. We're very pleased that uh, there is about 80% of the delegates are tuning in from Philippines, which is ultimately uh, the purpose of the project is to really help the local industry to bring the latest information and to bring the attention of our, uh, of our of the global industry uh, to, uh, to work with uh, the local industry as well. And this way, accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food culture and technologies. So we're very happy to, to welcome you all. Uh, with the little uh, experiment, uh, we would like to invite every one of you uh, to join us right after we finish the webinar. Uh, right after, please uh, join the Zoom uh, link, the Zoom call. There's a link in the resources on, on your, on your uh, right side of the screen. And please join us so we have a little bit of that visual. So let us, let us see uh, the audience that have tuned in. It's a little bit of experiment. We haven't tried it uh, before, but I would please ask you to uh, to join us for a few minutes just to see uh, each other, uh, the audience that have joined the webinar and the, the, the leaders in the market that are here to form uh, the partnership uh, to help the uh, build the food coaching in the Philippines. So uh, with that, uh, allow me to just show you quickly. This is roughly the screen that you see in front of you for your webinar you see that there are different windows with different content. You are able to freely close and open, uh, move around or extend the size, uh, make it full screen of any of the window that you wish. So you can play around with the, with the platform and, and uh, set it up the way it, uh, it's useful for you. You can also see the bio of the speakers and the resources on the right side, including the, uh, the Zoom link invitation right after the webinar. I would also like to invite you to our upcoming event on, on, on 7th of October. We will be organizing our first technical training workshop dedicated to advanced technologies for commercial food retail. To explain, uh, under the Coach Innovation Hub, we will be organizing uh, different formats of live events. This is a live webinar. Now, we talk about 60 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes of uh, topic uh, of a content dedicated to a certain topic. Our technical training webinars, uh, workshops, are meant to focus, zoom in, focus on particle technologies and really focus on installation, maintenance, service, and these aspects of uh, food culture chain uh, technology. So we'll be diving in and we'll have uh, external experts sharing uh, the best practice on the projects, both in Philippines, uh, in Southeast Asia, and other uh, markets. So please uh, don't miss uh, our upcoming events. We'll be sharing and we'll be sending the invitation in the dedicated newsletters as well. Our planned, uh, we, we have a number of events planned for the rest of the year, but this uh, activity will continue into 2021 as well. As you all know, uh, it's uh, challenging to organize an in-person event, but we very much hope we will return to that uh, as well. But for now, our online live events webinars and technical trainings uh, will be uh, covering industrial refrigeration as well as 
transport. We'll be organizing a webinar dedicated to the concept of solid cooling for food cold chain, as well as introducing the new ideas when it comes to business model that can be applied uh, to food cold chain, such as the cooling as a service. With that, I would like to uh, give the word to our uh, our colleague based in uh, Philippines, Gilda Garibay. She's the project leader of uh, the uh, Global Partnership for Improving Food Coaching in the Philippines, and she will introduce you uh, the project. We will stay with you for the remaining 60 minutes, and we will also be available for the Q&A after uh, Devin's presentation. So uh, thank you again for your attention, and enjoy the webinar. Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Hilda Garibay. I'm here to present the, our project background. So the United Nations Industrial Development Organization is implementing a project in the Philippines called Global Partnership for Improving the Food Cold Chain in the Philippines. It is funded with the Global Environment Facility amounting to $2 million US dollars plus co-financing by other institutions amounting to around $25 million US dollars. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources is the government partner. Well, the executing partners are SHECO, Technical Education and Skill Development Authority, or TESDA, and financial institutions. The goal of the project is to identify, develop, and stimulate the development of low-carbon, energy-efficient refrigeration, innovation technologies, and business practices in the Philippines for use throughout the food cold chain whilst increasing food safety and security. Through the project, it is aiming to establish a global partnership between public sector, private sector, and financing institution for promotion of investment and support of best available energy efficient design technologies and practices transfer. The project has four components. For component one, Policy and regulatory assessment on the use of low carbon and energy efficient technology within the food cold chain. This is under the responsibility of the DNR. Component two, awareness and capacity building on the use of energy efficient, climate friendly and safe alternatives in the food cold chain. This is under SHECO and TESDA through the cold chain innovation hub. Component 3, technology transfer and established partnership among key stakeholders, also under SHECO and TESDA through the Cold Chain Innovation Hub. While the monitoring and evaluation of the project will be done by UNIDO. The Cold Chain Innovation Hub is the official platform of the project. Actually, it is our official brand. It will serve as the project's central ecosystem of technical resources, training, knowledge sharing, and stakeholders' collaboration. Its main objective is to increase adoption of best practice refrigeration and related services as well as communication throughout the food cold chain to ensure long-term impact. TESDA has been selected as the national entity to host the physical hub at its central office located in Metro Manila, particularly in Taguig. CCAI Hub has a website and a YouTube channel where learning knowledge and materials are posted. Presently, we have videos, articles, research report, also lineup events, so please subscribe to our website for updates. So that's all for the brief introduction of our project. And now let's welcome my colleague based in Tokyo, Japan, Devin Ishimoto, for the presentation of our research. Devin? Gilda, thank you very much. And uh, everybody, thank you for joining us today. We're uh, very excited to uh, have you all join us. And uh, so many people from all around the world and, and a lot of uh, attendees from the Philippines. So, you know, we're very excited to contribute to this very important discussion uh, that is going on right now with the food cold chain, food security, food safety. Um, and we've done a little bit of research to learn about the market. And we also have uh, experts from overseas and knowledge that we've gained from overseas uh, about technology uh, that we'd like to contribute to this discussion. So let me move on to this next slide. Uh, this next slide is uh, a picture of our research report that we have uh, posted online on our website, cci-hub.org. 
Um, some of the things that we just want to focus on today are some baseline figures and trends and alternative technologies. So those are two things that we are going to be uh, addressing over the next uh, about half hour. First of all, one thing we want to emphasize, we just want to leave you with this, uh, this one point. Um, based on our research findings, we, we, we see that the Philippines really has an opportunity today to leapfrog some of the traditional equipment that is being employed in this sector and implement world-class refrigeration technology and innovations. And we can do this while also reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions and increasing food security and food safety at the same time. So this is a very big opportunity for the Philippines. Uh, now we want to get into some main indicators that we found with our research, um, just to give a, a broad overview of the current situation. So according to the Cold Chain Association of the Philippines, there are about 40 cold storage warehouse operators listed as members with over 100 cold storage facilities in operation today. Majority of them are located on the northern island of Luzon or in the national capital region, otherwise known as Metro Manila. And the Cold Chain Association of the Philippines membership roster spans several different industry sectors. So we can kind of get an idea of just how many different stakeholders are involved in the food cold chain from food import, processing and logistics, not only cold storage warehousing, but also refrigerated transport, commercial food retail and quick service restaurants. Uh, many stakeholders are involved in the food cold chain. Now, one thing we want to highlight is the Philippines Market Development Index number that we uh, have sourced from the Global Cold Chain Alliance. They've, uh, according to a recent research study, they've identified the total refrigerated warehouse capacity to be around 2 million cubic meters at the moment. What they've done is they've analyzed uh, this total refrigerated warehouse capacity available per urban resident, and they've given it a market development index number. So that number, uh, according to the report, is 0 0.037 cubic meters per urban resident. Uh, just to give a little bit of context to this number, at this point, uh, the relative needs or the potential needs of the market compared to the urban population is still relatively low in the Philippines. Uh, some indicators that they've given are numbers in the high area from 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 in countries like New Zealand, the United States. Um, but Philippines is still on the low index number. So we see that this indicates there is still a major development opportunity in the Philippines in the cold storage sector. The commercial food retail overall is growing, and it's growing very quickly. Uh, according to a recent study, the total uh, market value of the food retail sector in the Philippines today is around $49.9 billion. Um, and this is growing. We have a list of some of the top five food retailers, top five convenience stores in the sector. The reason we're pointing this out is because in the commercial food retail sector, Sari Sari stores are still a large portion of the market. Uh, for those of you who are joining us overseas, uh, Sari Sari stores are sort of the neighborhood convenience stores that sell food, um, but also other uh, daily convenience items. But there is not a uh, large focus on refrigeration equipment. I mean, there might be a couple plug-in units, but compared to modern grocery retail, um, these types of stores are still a large portion of the market. And modern grocery retail, supermarkets, hypermarkets, convenience stores, and even warehouse clubs are increasing their market share. In the refrigerated transport sector, uh, what we've done is we've looked at a recent study done in the UK by a company called Dearman Engine Company. And they were doing an analysis of transport refrigeration in emerging markets. 
One thing that they pointed out in this report is that refrigerated transport, especially in major developing economies, is going to grow at an even faster rate than the cold chain as a whole. They basically see that refrigerated transport is a, is a high growth area. And what they've also done is they've compared the total number of refrigerated vehicles in certain countries to the total population of urban residents. Um, and what we've done is we've, they, they didn't look at Philippines specifically, so we just took uh, these numbers from uh, other sources like World Bank Statistics um, and the Cold Chain Alliance of the Philippines. Right now, there are about 10,000 refrigerated vehicles compared to an urban population of around 50 million. Um, we compare that to France, which has a similar urban population, about 55 million. Um, they have over 140,000 refrigerated vehicles. So there's still uh, major development left in this area. We looked at some indicators in the post-harvest sector. Um, We're all very familiar that there is post-harvest uh, food loss in uh, areas of the Philippines. And one of these uh, reports, uh, a re report done by the Philippine Department of Science and Technology in 2017 indicated that in the fruits and vegetable sectors, post-harvest loss can grow up, can be up, up to 48%, 40%. What they've said though, however, is that this is mainly due to physical factors such as handling. Um, but other studies that have been done also have indicated the potential for cold chain infrastructure to contribute and reduce the number of, uh, reduce the amount of food loss. Uh, one of these studies um, highlighted carrots, cabbage, and onions, um, and the technology that can be used, the refrigeration technology specifically, that can be used to reduce uh, losses in these areas. And some of the major trends driving growth in the cold chain sector in the Philippines uh, we talked about with uh, Mr. Anthony Dizon from the Cold Chain Alliance of the Philippines. Of course, these are population growth, um, a shift in consumer preference from fresh to chilled products, um, especially with uh, policies like the National Food Safety Act, uh, moving uh, the, well, increasing the focus on food safety. And wet markets are starting to introduce cold chain equipment, technology and practices in the Philippines as well, as well as access to regional export markets. Uh, this is driving growth in the cold chain sector over the next five years projected to be about eight to 10% annually. Okay, and uh, just to continue on here, one of the major challenges is electricity prices. Uh, a lot of um, everyone in the Philippines is probably already very familiar that the Philippines has one of the highest rates of electricity, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, one study indicated that compared to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines has a very high average price of electricity, roughly at around 20 cents per kilowatt, kilowatt hour. Of course, there are other major challenges, um, challenges that deal with uh, capital costs and the lack of skilled labor um, there are still there's still room to improve the uh, national policies and the cooperation between that and the local government regulations. Um, also, some constitutional limitations on foreign investments, and of course, uh, supporting the logistics infrastructure with uh, you know transport and IT. These are all still challenges that remain in the cold chain sector today. And on top of all of that, uh, this year with uh, COVID-19, there are a number of uh, different impacts. And this conversation is, is, is still ongoing right now. It has been ongoing for several months now. Um, we've identified some of these trends that we've seen, some of these effects of COVID-19 on the Philippines food cold chain. We highlighted them in, in a video we published in June. So we definitely encourage you to check it out if you are not familiar yet, but this is all happening now and a very, very significant part of our conversation today. All right, so let me just, uh, let me just check the time now. So we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, we are going to be addressing some of the technology alternatives now that we see. Um, 
really global trends that are happening all over the world in terms of low carbon, sustainable refrigeration technology. And these are technologies that are not only um, the latest technologies, but they are mature technologies and they are available in the market today. One of these we want to highlight in industrial refrigeration is low charge ammonia refrigeration systems. So traditionally we have ammonia systems for industrial refrigeration and cold storage, um, cold storage facilities that use very large charges of ammonia. This can be reduced significantly with some different configurations and technology and engineering improvements that we're seeing today. Um, so these are some systems listed below, optimized ammonia direct expansion systems, packaged ammonia systems, and even ammonia CO2 cascade and secondary systems. We're also seeing a trend, a global trend with transcritical CO2 systems uh, being used. So no ammonia, just, uh, just CO2 itself. Uh, typically, these are employed at smaller sized facilities, but this is also increasing today. So just to give you an idea, um, the global trend that we're seeing right now is that these low charge ammonia systems are being adopted at a very high rate uh, over the past few years around the world, over 4,000 plus low charge ammonia installations that we've counted as of 2019. And we're also seeing some of the first steps being taken today over the past few years in the Philippines implementing these systems. This one example here is all forward warehousing in General Santos in the Philippines, where they store canned tuna and tuna loins. Uh, opened in 2016, they've employed the ammonia CO2 cascade refrigeration type system to power their cold storage, the uh, refrigeration capacity of their cold storage facility. We also want to highlight Gentech Storage, uh, who we've spoken to in the past. They already have three cold storage facilities up and running using ammonia CO2 secondary systems. Some examples from overseas as well using different configurations. Uh, this is Liberty Cold Storage in Chicago, Illinois, opened about five years ago. They use an optimized ammonia direct expansion system, so a centralized system, not packaged, uh, not a cascade or secondary system using CO2, but reducing the size of the ammonia charge all the way down to 7,500 pounds through different improvements in engineering, technology, and components. And these types of systems are being employed um, at a very high rate today. Lastly, we want to highlight one end user in Japan, Yokohama Reito. Um, two, two installations we want to highlight here, one in Saitama, where they've employed ammonia CO2 secondary systems, and one recently opened, uh, just very recently, at near Haneda, near Haneda Airport in Tokyo. Their distribution center uses both ammonia CO2 cascade systems as well as CO2 uh, transcritical CO2 systems, or CO2 condensing units, uh, on their own in the same facility. So, a lot of end users around the world uh, employing this technology, and even in the Philippines today. But one thing we want to highlight here is that there are benchmarks for cold storage uh, facilities for energy use. Um, this is this has been uh, being in development for a long time already, and these are some of the best practice figures that are in use in the industry today. So this is specific energy consumption, basically kilowatt hours per cubic meter of cold storage per year. And the graph that you see on the right is uh, best practice curve. Uh, the vertical axis is the specific energy consumption ratio figure. And the vertical, uh, the horizontal axis is the size of your facility. And basically what we see is as your facility grows in size, your best practice SEC figure tends to go down. But basically what you don't want to have is an inefficient large facility or inefficient small size facility. For example, 50,000 cubic meters uh, should have a best practice figure of around 16 kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year. And of course, there are many different factors that influence uh, energy consumption. but. Um, these are some of the figures that we found that have been accepted as benchmarks in the sector globally uh, today. 
Now, quickly transitioning over to commercial food retail refrigeration. Um, one of the most popular systems that are being adopted today are hydrocarbon systems. So these are R290 plug-in systems, um, some of them using water loops, and also transcritical CO2 systems. So these are uh, transcritical CO2 systems that have been used in industrial refrigeration, but also as condensing units or centralized rack systems uh, for commercial food retail applications, the supermarkets and uh, convenience stores. The picture you see on the right is actually the marketplace a uh, store supermarket in Santalan Town Plaza in Manila using R290 plug-in units. And this is a recent installation also in the Philippines. One other uh, end user we'd like to highlight is Royal Duty Free in Subic Bay in the Freeport zone. Uh, opened just very recently as well this year using R290 plug-in cabinets and a water loop system Now, as far as transcritical CO2 installations go, this is also a global trend that we are seeing increasing very rapidly, around 35,000 plus installations today. And this has been growing over the past uh, 10 years around the world. And we've, uh, we have a, a little table there to show in different regions of the world just how much it has increased uh, over the past few years. Freight refrigeration is also a very important uh, topic and sector. Um, but in this sector, we see as well uh, natural refrigerants are being adopted, like the carbon dioxide. Uh, we have a picture here of the Carrier Transit Cold's natural line CO2 um, container uh, that is being adopted by companies like DFDS Logistics, uh, Maersk. Uh, these are um, shipping companies that operate in Europe and also in, the, in North America. And this is also a trend that we are seeing increasing today. Well, finally, we get into post-harvest refrigeration uh, technology alternatives. And this is one case study that we particularly, like, particularly would like to highlight because uh, in this sector, there are a lot of uh, different options employing uh, you know, solar energy and thermal storage and natural refrigerants. This is one of the sectors that we see a lot of potential uh, to help in, especially uh, in the Philippines today. But this uh, one example is from a very recent uh, news story that was published. Um, this is in Nigeria, where the uh, one uh, several different farms in Nigeria and farm uh, clusters and pro produce aggregation centers are employing walk-in cold rooms that are based on natural refrigerants and also use uh, solar energy. And these have had a big impact on the community in those uh, rural areas. And you can see they're also using an interesting business model. It's pay as you store. And they've won a prize from Cooling as a Service, um, an organization that has been recognizing new business models and ways for uh, people to afford this infrastructure where they might not be able to otherwise. So this is a pay-as-you-store business model. Um, it's using an R290 monoblock, uh, solar energy, and uh, it keeps its fruits and vegetables at a temperature of about 5 degrees. They've seen that this has increased the shelf life of the fruits and vegetables from about 2 to over 3 weeks. It's increased the income of a lot of the farmers in the region. It's created new jobs, especially for women um, as well. So a lot of uh, benefits to this type of business model and this, uh, these refrigeration technologies, especially for the post-harvest sector. And lastly, actually, we'd like to touch on transport refrigeration. And, and this is still, you know, these are actually um, uh, units that are in operation today, but this sector is still um, in the nascent stage, but we see that today this is being employed with natural refrigerants replacing uh, diesel-powered tran uh, transport refrigeration units. We're also, they're also incorporating um, electric vehicles, electric motors, and electric um, transport refrigeration units as well. These are all in different, in different ways, but we see different manufacturers and end users employing this around the world. Um, you see Carrier Transit Cold's uh, CO2 refrigeration unit being used in Europe. Uh, the picture on the top right is uh, end user in South Africa 
using, I'm oh, sorry, manufacturer in South Africa that is uh, making refrigerated trucks using R290 based transport refrigeration units. Thermal King has uh, adopted 100% electricity for their refrigeration units. And even very recently in New Zealand, uh, an end user of food retailer Foodstuffs, uh, in cooperation with their partners, has de uh, deployed electric reefer trucks, 100% electric reefer trucks. So a lot of innovation happening in this sector as well. So um, just looking at the time now, and uh, just in the interest of time, we just want to make sure that um, we highlight this main point again. Um, really what we see is that uh, we hope that these uh, baseline figures and, and these global trends can really come together and highlight um, the, the way that we can work together and cooperate and bring the industry together to help the Philippines leapfrog um, and avoid replacement costs and, and, and avoid, you know, having to take on um, extra costs in the next, you know, five to 10 years of employing, uh, really take advantage of the chance to employ some of the uh, latest technologies in the world, ultimately to help increase the food safety and the food security situation in the Philippines while also minimizing greenhouse gas emissions at the same time and setting the stage for the infrastructure of the future. So we just want to remind you that um, the report is available in full online. Uh, so you can uh, go to our website and see uh, some of the other information that we've assembled together. We think it's, uh, it's very uh, useful and we, we hope that it's helpful. And lastly, I'd like to um, highlight how you can get involved and how you can learn more. So really, we're very excited to, to, to have everyone participating in the webinar today because it's, it's really the first time that we get a chance to speak directly uh, to you and uh, all of you in the Cold Chain Innovation Hub community. We encourage you to um, check out our, our uh, industry contribution questionnaire our call for industry contribution questionnaire if you're a manufacturer or supplier that like to, or even an expert, industry expert, academic researcher uh, who'd like to contribute to the project. You can also sign up for our mailing list to make sure you're staying up to date on our latest activities. And uh, just like Jan and, and Gilda mentioned earlier, we have a, a lot of activities that we have planned uh, upcoming in the near future. One of those, um, just to highlight one more time, is on October 7th, uh, a technical training workshop where we are going to be highlighting uh, some of these uh, technologies that are actually being implemented today uh, in the Philippines. We'd also encourage you to check out our YouTube channel uh, where we've uploaded a few videos. Uh, one of them was about the, the COVID-19 impact, but we're also highlighting some uh, interviews with experts where we talk about uh, these topics in more detail. So, yeah, we are very excited to have you all here today. And now we would like to move into the Q&A section. So we have uh, about 20 minutes left. Uh, so uh, give us a second. Uh, let me just coordinate with our team. Um, let's uh, see if we have some questions. Uh, so I'm sitting here Hello. with Jan. This is Jan. Uh, so we have received uh, we have received uh, quite a few questions. So uh, we will be uh, trying to address most of them. They are of a technical character. So uh, I hope we'll be able to answer most, but perhaps not all of them. So allow us to get in touch with the experts uh, to provide some answers if needed. So I will uh, I will I'm looking at all the questions that we are receiving. Please uh, keep on sending them. We will try to address as many as possible. So I will start with um, this one. So we'll be able to push to slide. Please uh, let us know if you can see it. Hopefully you will be able to. So audience view. All right. So the first question, I will, I will read it uh, for everyone. How hydrocarbon is only good for walking and not for the big system due to the charge limit. So yes, indeed, uh, what we have been seeing that hydrocarbons are mostly used in the plug-in refrigeration systems. Uh, still, uh, the, the, the predominant uh, solution is under 150 grams of propane used in these uh, factory sealed systems. 
there is uh, actually several millions of, of these units, right? Very small uh, to, to uh, larger, but still within 150 grams. Now, IEC standard, international standard, have approved the increase of the charge to 500 grams of propane. So we will see uh, quite a lot of new dynamic in this market. However, we also know that there is uh, larger systems using hydrocarbons, so indirect systems using glycol, very popular solution for, uh, for instance, uh, Belgium, Belgium retail called Colerute. They are using the indirect hydrocarbon systems with glycol uh, circulating uh, in the stores in showcases. Hydrocarbons are also used in, in very large industrial refrigeration type of uh, systems for, for instance, petrochemical industry. Hydrocarbons are also used in chillis. So there's actually quite a lot of applications for the large applications uh, as well. So hopefully that helps answer the question. Next question. We had uh, a question about the use of transcritical in the uh, tropical uh, tropical environment. So uh, would I push that question to you? I believe I can't see it right now because I've heard answered it. So, the CO2 transcritical, of course, uh, there's a lot of discussion in the last 10 years when it comes to efficiency of CO2 transcritical systems and the so-called uh, equator below which the efficiency of the CO2 system was not very, very high. However, the discussion and the development of the CO2 systems and the different, uh, different uh, features such as uh, ejectors and, you know, gas, uh, and, and other parallel compression and so on. So the CO2 systems have have tackled this challenge. The manufacturers have tackled the challenge. And since uh, three, four, close to five years ago, we have been seeing the CO2 systems being installed across all ambient temperatures, very, uh, very high ambient temperatures. We know about CO2 systems being deployed in Indonesia, in Africa, in uh, South of America, very hot in places like Atlanta, uh, in Japan, across uh, Okinawa. So the efficiency of the CO2 systems have been improved. And it's really about optimizing the, the complete system when it comes to uh, heat reclaim, using the heat that is generated by the system and so on. So we will see uh, CO2 is, is uh, here to stay and uh, there is more and more discussions about you know, how these systems can be deployed in all ambience. Next question. We see uh, ongoing discussion about basically ammonia and, and CO2. So I, I'll display this point uh, from uh, Mr. Cesar Lim. The discussion is about CO2 versus ammonia versus ammonia CO2 cascades, right? So, so there are different solutions for industrial refrigeration. Uh, they are competing and uh, the end user is the ultimate uh, voice, uh, the ultimate decision maker in this process. And efficiency plays a role, uh, of course, the, the facility itself, and there are many other indicators. The local, uh, the local policy and regulation, the availability of the trained technicians, the, the, the let's say, the, the experience with these systems by the end user. Right? There's many different factors that determine which system will be used. Efficiency, of course, is one of the, the, the very key. And what we see, for instance, in, in Japan and other countries is there are a number of solutions that are competing. Among them, the ammonia CO2 systems, both cascade and secondary, increasingly more uh, with CO2 transcritical, especially for the smaller systems. So it's the end user uh, that, that will make a decision about the system to be installed. And of course, our role and our responsibility is to make sure that we provide as much as uh, information available to the decision maker to make the right decision. So the, there is not one solution to fit all. But would we see that the technologies, uh, the development of these technologies have, have uh, progressed quite a significant uh, way since, uh, since a couple of years ago? I have a question from Alex Kopachai. Devin, this is for you. So I'll read it out or you can see it on the screen. Okay, Devin, do you really think you can read it here? I really think the coal sector will be the same. Globally. I think the traditions of Fresh produce is still popular in many countries. U.S. Okay, sorry. Let me let me read this out out loud again uh, one more time. I think that the traditions of using fresh produce is still popular in many countries. In the U.S., the use uh, in the U.S. the use of pre-cooked food is higher than in most countries. So, using a general statistic is to be used with care and looking at traditions. Yes, um, you know I think this is a very good point. Um, 
the the use of uh, the, the the fresh produce market and the agricultural market the agricultural sector in the Philippines has its own uh, unique characteristics. And, you know, we really want to, um, you know, emphasize the point that we we are not necessarily the experts in this space, but we uh, are pointing to some um, interesting uh, reference points and sources uh, and studies that have been done by um, academic researchers and industry associations in the Philippines. And really what we hope is that there is more dialogue and discussion by overseas experts and experts in the Philippines to really kind of have what is really specifically needed uh, for the Philippines uh, agricultural fresh fruits and uh, vegetable sector specifically. So we really hope that this discussion takes place between uh, all interested uh, stakeholders to get an, an accurate picture. All right, thank you very much, Devin. And there is another question uh, from a consultant, Eduardo Sterle. Uh, please, you can see it on the screen, all the push there. Okay. It's regarding the... Uh, Philippines index of refrigeration volume per capita is very low, even when compared with Asian neighbors, uh, Vietnam's, okay? Yet the ownership of do domestic refrigerators per household in Philippines isn't so low, 46%, compared to only 30% in Vietnam. That's very interesting. I did not know that. Um, in uh, domestic, in the domestic refrigerator household uh, sector. Which sector causes Philippines to be so far behind? Industrial retail or transportation, does this current gap give the country a larger chance to leapfrog directly to low GWP refrigerants? You know, I think um, from what we've seen from our research, it's, it's a combination of uh, several different areas, and especially with the impact of, of COVID-19, this discussion is ongoing today. Um, which sector um, you know, is the biggest uh, sector that needs to be focused on the most, you know, from post-harvest to transport um, to retail. Um, what we've seen is that there really is uh, a need for um, refrigeration technology in the post-harvest and transportation sectors. Um, this has been highlighted by, you know, a lot of coverage that has been done on the impact of COVID-19 uh, from what we've seen. So, you know, at this point, I would say in the in the post-harvest and transportation sector, really uh, sectors that have opportunities to be focused on uh, with this technology. Um, but that's also interesting. Uh, I did not know that in the domestic refrigerators, uh, domestic refrigerators were also at uh, such a high level of adoption. Jan, I mean, do you have an, an opinion about that? I mean, uh, from the research that we've done, do you, the post-harvest sector and transportation sectors, uh, areas we really would like to highlight are in need right now. I mean, this is what, uh, ever since March and all, all the developments that we all aware of, it, it really led us to, to to understand this problem in more depth, what, what the industry is facing. I think it's accelerated the problem that, that, that was existing already when it comes to the uh, the food uh, food loss and, you know, the, the, the collapse of the logistics in, in March and April that, that was experienced, uh, not only in the Philippines, I believe. Really led to to uh, to let us to understand that this is where the biggest bottleneck lies, perhaps, and this is where the biggest opportunity for industry uh, might be when it comes to increasing the efficiency of the the food coaching as a whole and, and reducing the food loss. So, to create the volume basically in this way. So, I would agree that these are the two main aspects. I will move on to uh, another question, a very good question, actually. Technicians must be well trained in handling uh, hydrocarbons. I have been involved in hydrocarbons handling and training since early 2000. Is there a training uh, for handling hydrocarbons in the Philippines? This is a very good question, and uh, we have uh, we have mentioned that this this very webinar we have limited time, so we have focused on on uh, particular uh, technology aspects. We have not uh, talked in in depth uh, about the policy and training and capacity building. However. They are extremely important topics, and they will be addressed under the projects. We have uh, the whole component is dedicated to policy and a training capacity building. So uh, I do not know uh, the answer specifically. However, we will work with the experts from an uh, institute like TESDA. We actually, for the upcoming, uh, upcoming uh, technical training workshop, we would like to include uh, the, the training and of technicians, especially when it comes to handling of flammable refrigerants. So I would, uh, I would advise to please join us on 7th October for the commercial refrigeration uh, uh, webinar workshop that will be addressing these topics. 
We have another technical question. Um, perhaps someone from the audience would be able to confirm uh, if the CO2 unit used in uh, the shipping containers are water-cooled or air-cooled. My understanding is they are air-cooled, but I might be wrong. Uh, so maybe someone from the audience can confirm uh, whether the uh, the carrier natural line uh, units are air-cooled or water-cooled. Uh, if not, we will provide the answer in follow-up. Another, uh, there is a training I'm hearing from uh, Cesar Lim that there is training for hydrocarbon, so we will definitely be able to share more information about this topic uh, later on. I have another confirmation when it comes to the use of uh, hydrocarbons uh, in larger systems from from an expert uh, from the field, uh, Mr. Alex Kapachai. So hydrocarbons are widely used for chillers and can do chill store or cascade system for warm countries. When the chiller stands outside, there is no limit for the charge size. So this, this is a very useful comment. Thank you, Alex. Uh, actually, we have talked about uh, a huge cold storage that are served by the hydrocarbons. And I believe the, the case study was from New Zealand. We had this case study from a company called EcoChill in, in New Zealand just a few weeks ago. So there are systems. They are probably not the most common, but they are hydrocarbon-based uh, uh, cold storage systems as well. Yeah, and it's an interesting application because um, what the uh, contractor told us is that this end user is using it to store kiwi uh, for ex export. And, um, you know, they really, this is really a key uh, logistics facility for export of fruits uh, from New Zealand. So a very interesting case study. And uh, if anybody wants to learn more about that, just, uh, just let us know and we'll send over the We have a non-technical question. Uh, the Philippines has a problem in helping the industry despite the cold chain being part of the public-private partnership since the last administration. The present one seems to be preoccupied more with uh, growing food rather than storing and conserving them. Can your initiative come up with benefits to both investors and customers of the cold chain in which government can uh, implement? Devin, would you like to take this question? Yeah, I mean... There are actually, from, from the research that our team has done, um, you know, over the past few months, around the world, especially in emerging economies, research into the post-harvest sector and the benefits of refrigeration technology in so many different areas uh, is need, there's a need to be, to communicate and emphasize those benefits to all the different stakeholders in, involved in the process. And, you know, just to give you an example, uh, in India, there's an initiative going on right now too. Uh, the president would like to double the income of uh, farmers and um, they are doing it by implementing clean cooling technology, sustainable and innovative cooling technology in the rural and agricultural sectors. And uh, one thing that we saw is that there really is a need to highlight all the benefits that uh, this will have, not only for reducing food loss, but you know, reducing food loss can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions because the food is not rotting in the ground. Um, it increases the number of jobs uh, for people in uh, rural areas. It increases income. It, it contributes to food security of the country. Um, it contributes to energy efficiency and cost benefits long term. Of course, there are high capital costs in the be beginning, but long term benefits for end users and businesses. Um, really investment opportunities for implementing infrastructure that will not need to be replaced uh, over the next 10, you know, 15 years uh, because of international regulations on greenhouse gas emissions uh, and the need to reduce um, energy use. Uh, so there, there, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting um, point to know that there are so many benefits to several different stakeholders that need to be emphasized. Um, and we plan on highlighting uh, this in our initiative as well. So, yeah, we hope that we can contribute to the discussion going on in the Philippines right now in, in this way. Thank you, Devin. Uh, in the meantime, we have received a confirmation that the CO2 reefer is actually air-cooled uh, CO2 system, not uh, water-cooled, so it's air-cooled. We have another uh, question. We will not be able to answer all of them, but we will do our best in the, in the, in the next few minutes. We can even extend the webinar for, for a few minutes. Next question is, um, which direction is best to adapt for the Philippine situation, low GWP refrigerant or hydrocarbon? I would say, uh, basically, if we, if we step back, 
If you look at the cold chain, there are many different sectors from the production, collection, production, transport, uh, cold storage, uh, all the way to the to the uh, let's say the, the the residential refrigerator. In this in this whole chain, you have several different technologies. We know many examples from the rest of the world that number of these sectors can be served by uh, by very low GWP uh, natural refrigerants. Uh, with, uh, with a very high efficiency. Uh, they have been proven in many sectors. Of course, residential uh, refrigerators is, is one of them, but increasingly more we have the evidence for commercial refrigeration, for industrial refrigeration. Industrial refrigeration have been using uh, natural refrigerants, ammonia, for, for, uh, for centuries. So the, what we believe is, and what the intention of the project is to not to recommend any one particular technology. We would like to help elevate the uh, the understanding of the available choices. We would like to bring the experts from different parts of the world to help communicate about these technologies, about how to handle them safely, how to operate, and not only hydrocarbons, of course, all of them, CO2, ammonia, hydrocarbons, other solutions. The choice will be done by the end user, by the market. We would like to bring the attention of the, of the global experts, the global in industry to help contribute it in accelerating this change. We believe we have the opportunity to leapfrog from the existing systems, many of which are, are still R22. And we don't have to repeat the same mistake that we have done elsewhere, going with high GWP HFCs and other uh, outdated old technologies. So if we can help contribute to the transition all the way to the best available technologies, and uh, the, the availability of the training of the technician uh, is the barrier that let's remove this barrier and let's let the market uh, have access to the best technologies. It's not only the training and the technology. Often the barrier is the, is the financing. And that's another important aspect of the, of the coaching project, the, uh, the involvement of the, of the financing industry to addressing the different business models when it comes to applying these technologies. So there's many different angles. And there is no one solution. Uh, what we intend to uh, to contribute to under the project is to bring uh, as much as knowledge when it comes to technology, when it comes to maintenance, when it comes to financing, when it comes to policy. Address all the all the possible aspects of the project. Uh, we have one. I'll push it to the audience for Devin. To pay as you store idea is an excellent one. Will it be introduced in our country? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that I, I think you might be referencing the one of the slides where we talked about the cooling as a service prize winner for cold hubs in, uh, in Nigeria. I mean, this is just a news item that happened, uh, you know, a few a month ago. But this is not the only example of this. There are many, many different examples of this being implemented in uh, developing economies, um, you know, in, in India as well. And um, I think there was just a news story in CNN. Uh, about um, you know uh, different refrigeration technologies using different business models, so I think there's a very uh, big opportunity for this type of uh, business model to relieve these uh, upfront capital costs and, and help you know those who need this technology afford this technology, um, especially in the Philippines in, in the agricultural sector. Yes, I hope I hope so. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, another comment uh, relevant to our uh, question about the, the hydrocarbons and the training of technicians. So this is just a, a reach out uh, to, to TESDA. Uh, uh, Ms. Manuel Azuena, Azuena uh, offered uh, assistance when it comes to training of, of, of hydrocarbon, uh, you know, training for hydrocarbon or flammable refrigerants. So TESDA, as, as you have heard before, is the official project partner. TESDA will be hosting the, the Kochi and Innovation Hub, the physical Kochi Innovation Hub that we uh, are uh, preparing uh, as we speak. And uh, the offering the training for different technologies uh, will be uh, one of the main function of the, of the hub. So we look forward to this, to this cooperation. Uh, and just to add to the uh, topic of the pay as you store, uh, the cooling as a service is a new concept out there. There's a number of, of uh, examples from the, uh, the cold chain industry globally. We are yet to uh, hear more about the possible application in Philippines. However, and that's one of the the upcoming webinars that we have uh, we have informed you about. We would like to bring one of the experts when it comes to cooling as a service concept, a uh, Swiss-based organization called Base, uh, as uh, one of the presenters in the webinar to introduce this 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 thinking and this concept. And then, of course, uh, will it be 
applied in Philippines. This is this is not uh, up to us to to decide or. Uh, but we believe to to bringing these new ideas when it comes to cold chain applications, technology, policy, regulation, investing is is one of the uh, important aspects of the project. We are looking at the time, and then we have uh, we have reached our time when it comes to the webinar. Uh, we are uh, there's there's a number of other questions we will we will address uh, all of them in um, in the follow up. I'm looking at the other question, uh, but uh, I would say it just keeps coming. So I will, I will stop here. Uh, thank you again for your participation. It was fantastic to have uh, so much interest from on the on the side of the delegates, but also uh, quite a few questions coming in. We are extremely happy to have a large delegation from Philippines, including the government and users and uh, our local uh, technicians, our local industry, as well as the, uh, the world known experts uh, joining us today. This is really just uh, the first step. Uh, we will. We are already excited about the events that we'll organize in um, in uh, in October. Uh, we have another big event uh, planned for November, December. So there is uh, plenty of uh, opportunity for for the global experts that want to contribute to this discussion to work with us. Uh, please uh, get in touch. Let us know how you would like to be involved. And uh, with that, uh, we'd like to say thank you again to all of you for joining us today. We will be sharing the recording and the slides with you after the event uh, will be uh, within this week. So you can go back to our slides and, and the recording as needed. And uh, with that, uh, allow me to remind you that uh, we would please like to welcome every one of you uh, or the ones uh, that uh, it's technically possible to join us on the Zoom uh, right uh, after this webinar, which is about one minute from now. So the registration uh, there on the window, there's a link. Indeed. So in the resources on the right side of the screen, you can actually see uh, the Zoom link. So you can click on it. It should lead you directly to the uh, to the Zoom window. So we look forward to, to having this visual, uh, to seeing uh, our delegates, and then hopefully there will be many of you able to join us. So uh, thank you again, and uh, see you in a bit on Zoom. Thank you.